Trails Collective, what's shaking? Ian here for the weekly rundown of the Northeast Trail Running World for the week ending November 19th, 2021. Uh, hopefully this finds you all doing great. Um, I had a very busy and beautiful weekend. Uh, I was with uh, the women uh, that I assist in coaching for the Ithaca College uh, women's cross country team at our regional race at uh, Geneseo. And it, was, uh, it wasn't the day we had hoped for. Uh, a couple of them had really I mean, one had the race of her uh, season for sure, uh, but a couple others just didn't uh, or weren't able to just bring it on the day. Uh, so we didn't end up advancing to nationals as we had hoped, uh, but so it goes sometime. Um, but very, uh, so very proud of all of them. Uh, one of the closest knit teams that I have ever, I think, seen. Um, their spread was pretty outstanding and they had really good connections with one another. So uh, very proud of the season they had, even though it didn't end as we had hoped. Uh, right after that race, I had to uh, actually literally, as they were coming out of the, uh, the chute, I had to hop in the car and uh, catch a flight up to Maine uh, to run the Bold Coast Bash. And uh, I'll get into that here in just a minute. But it made for a very busy uh, weekend. And then this week, on the actually leaving the airport, coming home on uh, Monday night, uh, just putting stuff in my car, left my laptop on top of my car and drove off with it. And... Uh, the sweet sound of it thunking, hitting the um, back of my rack as I was uh, getting onto the freeway, flying up into the night sky. I pulled over and nothing like watching your, your car like a, a fish out of water flopping as a car and truck kept running over it. So right now I'm trying to uh, catch back up and do what I can with an interim computer. Um, so just made for a crazy week, weekend. Um, but here we are. Uh, so in these episodes, I try to give you a rundown of what's been shaking in the Northeast uh, trail world. Uh, we may expand to other regions here at some point, but starting with the Northeast. And if there's any media that caught my attention, any gear that was on my radar or on my body or feet that week, I'll plug any uh, fastest known times uh, we will mention uh, in the region, get into some results of events, as well as voices from some of those events, and then carry you out with some of the events on deck for the upcoming weekend. So let's get into it. Uh, really busy week. I didn't have any time to really process other media. Uh, but gear, I did get a chance to, um, even though it's not always uh, the um, thing you're supposed to do, I enjoy trying gear right out of the box on race days. I find it kind of entertaining and no better way to see if a, a pair of shoes is going to work or what it feels like than uh, starting with a 50K right out of the box, uh, literally first time on my foot. Um, so I had the opportunity to uh, put uh, 31.5 miles into the uh, Speedland. Uh, the PDX, um, a company that is an uh, upstart company based out of Portland, uh, some uh, background for the co-owners uh, with the uh, shoe and manufacturing industry, um, but it actually ran really well. Uh, probably not quite as sticky of outsole rubber with their Michelin rubber as maybe VJ or uh, Innovate's Graphene, uh, but still did a pretty good job. Uh, really good ground feel. Uh, not really any hot spots, though I did get some rub after 31 miles in each of my, uh, my fat fifth toes. Um, but otherwise, it felt pretty good. Um, I chose to go without the... Uh, so they are built with a removable carbon plate that slides in this uh, groove or slot in the bottom. I have it at home at the moment. Didn't bring it in when I'm filming. Uh, but I chose to go without it for a little bit more ground feel. And a really interesting... I think concept in the makeup and the design of the shoe. And hopefully I'll get, I'll get into that uh, pretty soon with a shoe review there. And then also for the first time ran one of the uh, Smart Wool Intra Knit uh, Merino tops. Our temperature, we had a really beautiful day. It was probably uh, somewhere around maybe, I don't know, 50 degrees give or take and um, partly sunny, uh, really blustery on the coast, uh, but that sure performed really well. Uh, it felt kind of uh, cold uh, a little bit uh, in the woods. Uh, that kept me warm enough, still breathed really well, uh, and it vented enough uh, when we were exposed in the sun uh, in the coastline. But uh, two pieces of gear that I think performed uh, really well in the context of that race. Um, all right, fastest known times of the week. Jason Pajot and Bethany Gerritsen, two hours, seven minutes for the Tupper Lake Triad in New York. Uh, this covers Mount Arab, Coney Mountain, and Goodman Mountain. It's a 14 seven-mile circuit. Uh, with 2790 uh, feet of gain, and their mark is an opening mixed gender team mark. Uh, Michelle Zandona, six hours, one minute for the Ramapo Dunderberg circuit in New York's uh, Harriman uh, State Park. Uh, it's a 22 mile stout trail, offers 5,500 feet of gain, 
uh, while it traverses the park. And this is an opening women's unsupported mark. Good job, Michelle. Uh, Keith Nadu, 32 minutes, 47 seconds for the Chatham um, Marconi wireless route in Massachusetts. First, I thought it was a typo um, in terms of wireless, but then I looked into the history of the place, which is kind of cool. Uh, but it's a 5.2 mile traverse of the southeastern horn of Cape Cod. And Keith Betters, the original section setter, Jeff Shaw, by seven minutes. And it was cool to see uh, places of historic interest, such as this one, uh, when they pop up. Uh, in addition to just looking at and finding beautiful locations. Uh, this one, a namesake uh, to the pioneer of wireless communication. Uh, Googly Elmo, Elmo, or something to that effect, Marconi. Uh, he was an inventor, scientist, and businessman who created the practical radio wave-based wireless telegraph system. So no doubt, I probably wouldn't be bringing you this uh, right now in some way, shape, or form if it weren't for Marconi. So thanks, Googly Elmo. Nice work, brother. Debbie Livingston, 55 minutes, 24 seconds for the Haley Farm Bluff Point Loop. Uh, it's a 7.2 mile lollipop in Southern Connecticut. And Ben Robinson, three hours, 43 minutes for the Old Loggers Path. Uh, it's a 27 mile loop in the Loyal Sox State Forest. And he shaved uh, 15 minutes off of uh, Eric now turned to racing marathons and Nike clown shoes Kozex, Mark from March of 2020. Uh, and another learning opportunity for me uh, as, as the beautiful streams, falls, and forests pop up in the photos of the old loggers path. Uh, it appears that Rock Run, uh, in part of the passage of the old loggers, uh, has been claimed to have been some of the best swimming holes in the entire U.S. So when I'm passing through that area at some point, I'm going to have to try to find myself some Rock Run and get myself and some kids in some uh, swimming holes. One of my kids is watching me now. Nora, you want to stop for some swimming holes at Rock Run at some point? Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. All right. So that's a bold claim, being some of the best in the, uh, the nation. And I'll have Nora tell you whether she thinks that's an accurate claim when we can get there. And anyone out there able to get behind them or that said claim, partaking in some of those swimming holes and cliff jumping, you let me know and see what you think. Let me know what you think of those uh, swimming holes. All right. Getting into the results and voices from the weekend. And uh, one or two, I think, here from uh, two weekends ago. Uh, Rosaryville Veterans Day 50K, put on by the Annapolis Striders, um, uses the uh, rolling single track of Rosaryville State Park in Marlboro, Maryland. It looks like a great option for beginners who might be intimidated by significant elevation or technicality. And of 101 finishers, Alexander Hetherington took the win in 410 with top women's finish going to Kristen Lamos in 4.33. MDT, or the Mason-Dixon Trail Challenge Trail Race, a seven-miler in Darlington, Maryland. Uh, it's a quick out-and-back uh, course format on the Mason-Dixon Trail. It's limited to 100 entrants. This is their fourth year. Uh, they saw a course record set by overall winner Gabriel Rodriguez in one hour, 17 seconds, with top female in the day going to Oliviana Angulo in 1.29. The Stone Mill 50. This 50 miler showcases the Seneca Greenway and Muddy Branch Trails in Montgomery County, Maryland of 2021. No, that's not right. I put up 2021 finishers, but clearly there wasn't 2021 finishers. I'm not sure what I meant to type there, but of the amount of finishers, maybe like 201 finishers, uh, Nicholas Cruzier. Uh, Cruz I th Nicholas, sorry if I butchered your last name, uh, Cruzo maybe, uh, took the overall win in 656 with Kristen Kelman, top woman in fourth overall in 810. And here to give us a deeper view of Stone Mill is finisher and VHTRC member uh, from Timberville, Virginia, Daryl Brubaker. Hi, my name is Daryl Brubaker and I ran Stone Mill 50 last Saturday, November the 13th. This is my third time running Stone Mill, which is rare because I don't usually like repeating races, but this one keeps me coming back. I'm a member of the Virginia Happy Trails Running Club, which helps out at a number of the aid stations and always has a bunch of runners in the field. And hearing all their stories and seeing the pictures of previous races got me to sign up to run my first 50 at Stone Mill back in 2018. The race takes place on the Seneca Greenway and Muddy Branch Trails in Montgomery County, Maryland. It's a very runnable course, and it was actually a Roadrunners Club of America National Championship race this year. There's a lot of single track and around 4,500 feet of gain over the 50 miles. Combine that with a perfect time of the year for running and fantastic aid stations, and I can't stay away. I love running in the mountains, and this year when Massanutten 100 was canceled, I 
kind of switched things up and signed up for a couple flat canal races, including Canal Corridor 100 last month in Akron, Ohio. I thought I might be able to come close to a 20 hour finish, but I had GI issues in the first third of Canal Corridor race and ended up stumbling through the last 60 miles for a finish well over three hours slower than I had hoped. So Stone Mill was a late ad this year as I wanted to make sure that I was recovered from Canal Corridor before attempting the 50. But I really didn't want to finish my race here with a 60 mile death march through Akron so I registered for Stone Mill with the sole purpose of enjoying a day in the woods with great people. And to make sure I kept it light, I did set three goals. Uh, first to run the first half slower than my two previous attempts, to positive split the back half of the course, and to eat a whole lot of food at aid stations. And I'm happy to report that I nailed all three of my goals this time around. By the halfway point, I was 30 minutes behind my 2018 pace. And ironically, the only bad weather we had on Saturday was the next two and a half miles, which took place on the CNO Canal towpath. When the wind picked up and it started to rain, got cold, just further cementing the fact that canal runs are definitely not for me. I celebrated the end of towpath running by passing through the ruins of the Seneca Quarry stone cutting mill and taking a shot of whiskey at the mile 27 aid station. The back half of the course is net uphill as you make your way back to the finish line, but not enough to account for taking over an hour longer as it did for me to complete than it did the first half. I passed each segment by listening to the music, dreaming about what food would be at the next aid station, and staring at the blue sky and fall foliage, which probably contributed to the three falls and countless stub toes along that last 25. Fueled by pierogies, quesadillas, tater tots, and a variety of soups, I bounded up the final hill and crossed the finish line just before the sun went down for a total time of 10 hours and 50 minutes, almost a full hour slower than my time in 2018 and nearly four hours slower than the winter this year. But I bet that I had as much fun as any of them. Thanks again to race director Barry Hopman, to all the volunteers and support staff, to all the friends new and old that I met on the course this year, we'll see you next time. So thanks for that clip, Daryl, and the Stone Mill crew. Thanks for uh, connecting me uh, with Daryl. Uh, one that did happen two weekends ago that we did plug with a uh, clip from an amazing performance from uh, Caleb uh, Bowen uh, is the Rim to River 100 in the New River Gorge, West Virginia. So I mentioned a week or so ago, it was all over my Facebook feed. Seems to be a new favorite for some regional uh, entrant, or from regional, I guess, people. Uh, beautiful course um, and a nice new 100 on the calendar. But the um, individual that also threw down in a really spectacular performance uh, on the uh, weekend uh, was Holly Ann Swan. Uh, she also raced in the first year, uh, 2020. Um, I think her time was, I, forget what her, I think her time was like 27 hours or something to that effect in 2020. Uh, this year she came back a uh, huge uh, chunk off to set a new uh, course uh, record and women's win in 19 hours. So a huge pickup. And here to pick, take us deeper into that day, uh, top women's finisher and fourth overall at Rim River, Holly Ann Swan. Hi, Trail Collective Nation. Um, Ian, thank you so much for the opportunity for me to share about my 2021 Rim to River experience. Um, I've had the fortune of being a part of both events. Um, last year was an inaugural year and um, both events have been um, polar opposites for me. Last year um, I sustained an injury around uh, 45 miles in to my right knee and ended up having to power hike around 55 miles um, where my knee like wasn't completely bending uh, like it should. So um, that was a pretty um, traumatic experience. Um, I just remember really finishing and thinking, you know, um, you know, I'll come back to the 100 mile distance some year, um, years down the line, but uh, it's not something that I'm going to do for a really long time. But um, 
after I got healed up, uh, another month or two later, um, I just, I had a lot of time to think about, um, all the big goals that I had going into 2020 and just felt like I didn't really get the chance to chase those, but because of the injury I sustained. So that ultimately led to me, um, wanting 2021 Room to River to be kind of a redemption year for me. Um, I came in with the same goals that I had last year um, that I didn't get to chase, and that was um, trying for a, a top five overall finish. Um, I was hoping that I could get that first female placement and um, just a sub-20 um, hour 100 miler. Um, I was able to accomplish all of those this past weekend. Um, it was a great day and thankfully I stayed healthy the whole time, um, which was the ultimate goal. Um, I ended up finishing fourth overall, um, first female and, uh, my time was 19 flat and 27-ish seconds. Um, it was an absolutely beautiful morning. Um, I, I prefer racing in cooler weather. Um, the start was around uh, sub 30 degrees, I think uh, 25 degrees maybe. And it kind of stayed cool and crisp all day long. Um, you would go through these hot and cold pockets as you're running through the gorge, um, be kind of cooler as you were going along the river. So I remember putting my arm sleeves and gloves on and taking them off and putting them back on um, over and over. But I wouldn't have it any other way. Last year was um, pretty similar, but um, it did get a lot hotter in the afternoon. And um, I remember having to take in a lot more water last year and kind of getting to that feeling of dehydration, um, which thankfully I didn't feel that way this year. Um, I think having this event the first weekend of November is, is going to be key um, for just having that ideal weather. Um, so for the first 17 miles of this race, I kind of uh, stuck with, hung out with um, number one, number two, Caleb and Dan. Um, we just kind of cruised along and um, laughed and chatted. And um, we got to that second aid station, they kind of uh, took off and uh, let them do their own thing. So for the majority of the day, I was kind of um, by myself and running through the gorge, um, getting to take in all the beauty. And um, yeah, I was by myself until 50 when I picked up my pacer, Brandon Perry. Um, uh, he kind of got me rolling. Um, he did a fantastic um, job of pacing me. And um, we kind of stayed in that third place um, placement until around 70 when um, Dirk passed us in um, Arrowhead, um, aid, around Arrowhead aid station. And um, unfortunately, uh, he did end up getting lost in the last few miles and um, ran 110 miles, um, which put him in that sixth place finish. But um, for him to run sub 20 uh, for over 110 miles, uh, he had a really phenomenal day. So I was pretty sad that um, he had the misfortune of getting lost. Um, and then I was passed by um, Daryl Dorsey, who ended up getting third place at the 85 and a half mile mark. Um, he was a fourth at Rome to River last year, and um, he's just a a fantastic runner. Um, so I was excited to see him there at 85 and a half. Um, I picked up my final pacer, my husband, at um, 93 and a half aid station. So he got to run the last seven and a half miles with me, which was really special. Just to have my husband cross the finish line with me at the end was um, really amazing. If you're looking for a 100 miler, um, definitely don't go any further than Room to River. Um, I can't say enough about this race. 
the views are phenomenal. Uh, New River Gorge is uh, officially a um, national park. Um, so you can check that off your buff bucket list. Um, running 100 miles through a national park is really awesome. Um, I might be a little biased, but um, I think West Virginia is one of the most beautiful states um, out there. Um, I think the elevation of Rimt River is perfect. Um, it is just challenging enough without being um, over the top. It's advertised at 16 to 17,000 feet of elevation gain. Um, my GPS had a little bit less than that, um, but um, in my opinion, perfect amount of ascending and descending. Another really cool thing is um, all of um, the money raised through this race goes to help a nonprofit set up by both of the uh, race directors, um, Brian and Laura, his wife. Um, their nonprofit is Adventure Appalachia. Um, so, yeah, um, set your alarms for January 1st and um, don't miss out on opportunity to run Rim to River for 2022. So, Holly Ann, thanks for that clip. And uh, yeah, it's going to be exciting to see what you do in the trail space. Uh, just connecting a bit, um, messaging in a different thread. Uh, Holly Ann has a good uh, running background, uh, all but albeit a bit uh, newer to the trail and ultra scene. And I'll be pretty excited to see uh, how she keeps uh, progressing. All right, Hamster Wheel, uh, 6, 12, 24, and 30 hour. Also ran two weekends ago as a timed event that run in New Boston, New Hampshire on November 6th. Um, and we are, I still don't see results posted, at least on Ultra Sign Up. I didn't, didn't get a chance to really dig in to see where they were or if they're out there anywhere yet. Uh, but I was stoked to get um, like Michael Lopresti in uh, with a clip this week. Uh, he put in a pretty outstanding effort. And so Michael, uh, cue us into Hamster Wheel. Hi, this is Michael Lopresti with the Connecticut Trail Mixers. Um, wanted to share a few brief thoughts on the Hamster Wheel Ultra Marathon, which was held recently in the first weekend of November in New Boston, New Hampshire. Um, our friends from Just Keep Running had put that race on. It was, I think, the first race I had done with them. Um, definitely looking to coming back. The uh, runners had an option of several different timed events to run, um, either the 6-hour, the 12-hour, uh, 24-hour, or 30-hour. Um, the course itself was a four mile loop um, course, uh, it included an out and back on a rail trail, which I actually really liked. It was kind of crushed um, stone with lots of leaves and pine noodles. So it was, it was easy. It was somewhat soft. It was non-technical and kind of hit cruise control for it. Um, it included at the end a, um, a link uh, loop around the fairgrounds itself to make uh, the, four, the four mile route. Um, the event was really well organized. The, um, the, the uh, volunteers were, were exceptional, including the, the overnight staff trying to stay warm and trying to keep us warm. Um, the, uh, probably the big story again was the cold. Um, we, even when we're setting up in Tent City at the start and finish line on Saturday morning, uh, temperatures were just in the 30s. Uh, they warmed up, up a bit as the day went on, um, but once nightfall came, um, your already depleted bodies are starting to get a little fatigued. Um, the temperatures dropped probably back into the mid-20s, and it was tough to stay cold. Um, I found that that was a good motivation for running versus walking um, because the running kept my core enough and the walking just wasn't warm enough to stay to keep me going. Um, but as always with overnight runs, when that sunrise came on Sunday morning, you get this, this recharge of energy. Um, you kind of shake the sleep off and just keep going. Um, so, uh, ended up being a great day. Um, I personally uh, finished up with 120 miles, which was a new distance PR for me. Um, and it was enough to actually take first place in the 30 hour division, which like never happens to me. So, um, just a thank you to all the, the fantastic uh, folks that just keep running and all the volunteers, uh, the fairgrounds, which hosted us. Um, it was a great event and I can't wait to be back for next year. Thanks. All right. Good job, Michael. That is a burly effort. Uh, that's a whole lot of miles, so uh, nice work. Um, down in PA, Taya Dalton Trail Challenge, 10K and half in Waterville, PA. Uh, this is one that I ranked number seven in the Trails Collective ranking of the toughest 25Ks in the Northeast. We'll have a link posted if you haven't found those articles, but they're under the Trails Collective's Features tab. And number 15 in the 10K lineup. Uh, Taya Dalton makes use of a beautiful course in the Pine Creek Valley. The course description includes 
The course will take runners on technical rocky and moss-covered trails with heartbreaking climbs and quad-busting descents. Amazing scenery will include vistas, dark hemlock and oak forest areas, trout streams, and small cascading waterfalls. Sounds pretty spectacular. Uh, maybe it's one I'm going to have to get down and do. Uh, maybe next year. We'll see. Uh, Reagan, McC Reagan McCoy crushed the prior 25K course record by nearly 30 minutes. It was a huge day for Reagan. Nice work. Uh, he finished in 144. And for the women, Lucy Kolb took the 25K win in 236. And in the 10K, Matt Lipsy continues to build back. I'm um, pretty stoked. I, I know he's not quite where he feels like he could be or back to his baseline just yet. But it seems like he's getting close and making up uh, ground in a hurry, so which is awesome to see. Uh, so he took the solid win in 42.51, also setting a new course record in the process with Hannah Darrow for the women in 104. And taking us deeper into Ty Dalton is 25K winner and new course record holder, Reagan McCoy. Hey, what's going on, Trails Collective? I'm Reagan, and I'd like to take a moment to talk about the Ty Dalton Trail Challenge that happened this past weekend. This is the second year running for the race. It's located in Waterville, Pennsylvania, the heart of the old Pine Creek Valley. And it's directed by Tracy Kemmerer. And the proceeds benefit a memorial scholarship for her son Casey, who tragically passed away in an ATV accident with a friend some years back. The race offers a 10K and a half marathon option, and I did the half marathon. Signing up for it, you know, there's some great friends signed up. Uh, really fast friends, I might add. Justin Beatty, who won the 10K last year, great friend of mine. Uh, Jeff Roll, who won the half. And a couple other guys who I never met, but put up a really, uh, really tough race. Starting at the DCNR headquarters there, you run down the driveway, across Route 44 to the Pine Creek Rail to Trail access, and you hit a trail called Old Wagon, which runs parallel to the rail trail. That first mile ended up going really fast. One thing I've been trying to work on is not looking at my watch when running, but just going off feel. I could tell we were going really fast, but I just went with it because it didn't feel too bad and ended up being one of the fastest miles I ever ran, which is kind of weird to have happen during uh, a half marathon. Um, we ran Old Wagon Road, which is relatively flat rolling uh, about a mile to the bottom of our first climb. Uh, those first two miles, though, the top five finishers were uh, in a really tight group together. I thought our first climb, Gleason, which is a Pennsylvania classic, one mile, thousand footer, uh, would give me a good chance to throw down and open up a good gap between some of the other runners. But I was wrong. Uh, on my heels the whole ride up was Sam Shaheen, who ended up finishing second. Um, it was really tough for me. I ended up running about 90% of Gleason. Um, which it's really technical, I, I gotta add, you know, a lot of loose rocks and leaves. Uh, we eventually summited. I took aid real quick. I think he took aid up the aid station, and we ran on Huntley Ridge on a trail called Ty uh, the namesake of the race, for a little bit. It's really neat. You look down, there's a really cool vista, which overlooks the DCNR headquarters where you start at. You can see the Bull Run Vista, which is the summit of your second climb, and you can see Middle Hill, which is the summit of your third climb. So some really cool foreshadowing for what's to come in the race. The descent off that trail uh, is about a mile down. There's a series of about 20 switchbacks. Known locally as the Ty Dot and Switchback Shuffle Kerfuffle. Uh, really fun descent, but you know, it always kind of does a number on my legs. Uh, you know, descending is not my favorite thing to do, but with Sam right on my heels, I gave it the best I could. Um, we went down that, we headed back towards DCNR up the Iger Trail, which is our second climb, and it was just introduced by DCNR last year, and it's quickly become a fan favorite of Pine Creek. Uh, half of the trail, you pretty much go straight up. When you get to the middle, it flattens out. Uh, if you look on your right, you can see some chiseled slate bedrock that was quarried around the turn of the century. Really neat, beautiful. Uh, then you finish your climb to the summit through a series of switchbacks. Takes you to the Bull Run Vista, which is one of the best views in Pine Creek in my opinion. There's an aid station there. I took a quick drink and I think Sam plowed through it. Our descent off of that is called Log Slide. Uh, it's about a mile. And as the name implies, it was an old log slide. 
So think how steep a grade must be to be able to skid a log one mile down the face of a mountain and you'll have a pretty good idea of what that trail is like. Uh, I got to the bottom, I was pushing pretty hard on it and out of the corner of my eye when I got to the bottom I could see Sam still hot on my heels and I was, you know, I was really tired at that point and I knew it was uh, uh, going to be a make or break race. Um, when we got to the bottom, we climbed up Lower Pine Bottom Road, Gravel Road, uh, gradual incline, uh, about seven tenths of a mile. Then you drop the bank, cross a stream, and head up your third and final climb called Wolf Path. When I dropped the bank there, I could see Sam was maybe a tenth of a mile or so behind me, which is the biggest gap we had during the race. And I knew then that um, you know my best bet was to try to push Wolf Path and run the whole thing, which I'd never done before. Um, and it was tough. It was definitely tough. Uh, I feel like it's probably the shortest climb of the race, but the steepest and maybe even the techiest. It's hard to say. But I was told by the people around the aid station at the top uh, before I summited, I must have drove a bear out towards them, which is kind of crazy. But, you know, it's really cool. Uh, I blew through that aid station because at that point there was only about two miles left and it was descending uh, down a trail called Middle Hill. Uh, awesome descent, but you know it's very easy to wipe out on if you're not cautious. At that point, I thought I had a good lead, but uh, mentally, I just pretended he was right behind me, kind of like racing that ghost in Mario Kart. Um, it's what it felt like. So I pushed that as hard as I could those last two miles of descending and ended up crossing the finish. And uh, you know, I think I ended up putting about a three minute uh, gap between us. Uh, the after party was awesome, like all kinds of food, pizza, pulled pork, uh, personal pies, like that you could just take home with you. And you know, I'm not really a pie kind of person, but if I was, I would have been all over that. And there's a variety of like seven different soups, like different soups that you could try. And I had the chili, the pulled pork, and the mac and cheese, and the pizza. And it was probably twice the amount of calories that what I burned during the race, but who cares? Uh, good time, you know, revive, outdoors are set up, Rum PA was set up, uh, so you can do some shopping there. Got a cool medallion for finishing, like a, a homemade pottery thing. Um, everyone got a cool sweatshirt and like a little Norway spruce sapling. Uh, you know, great race, great after party, uh, you know, great fellowship, great time to hang out with friends. Pine Creek's one of my favorite places in the world, fall is my favorite season, the two complement each other. Uh, like crazy. So really, Tracy puts on a great race. Please come see this. Um, you know, it's beautiful out there. If you love the fall and you want a good race to finish out your season, check out the Tie Dot and Trail Challenge. Thanks. So great job again, Reagan. Um, you are having a pretty good year. I think aside from World's End not going as you had hoped, um, I think you're running really well. Uh, so nice work, brother. All right, the, uh, I'm not going to pronounce it right, and I didn't get a chance to check out our clip yet, but the uh, Pocantico Hills Marathon in Sleepy Hollow, New York. Uh, the inaugural Pocantico uh, Hills Marathon ran over the beautiful rolling carriage roads of Rockefeller State Park, in, uh, in part to benefit the Park Preserve and also the New York-New Jersey Tra Trail Conference. Of 112 finishers, wins, and new course records were earned by David Hedges in 251. Uh, David, uh, one of um, probably the quickest and pretty versatile runners in the Northeast at the moment, as long as we can hang on to him. Uh, he is running for uh, Innovate at the moment, and I'm stoked to be supporting him um, in getting down to um, Bandera in January. I'm excited for that opportunity and uh, going for that golden ticket. In any case, he took the win in uh, 2 hours and 51 minutes. And Margaret Frank, a friend from here in Ithaca, took the win in 3.41 for the women's field. And giving us a deeper view into Picantico is women's winner and new course record holder, Margaret Frank. Hi, Trails Collective. My name is Margaret Frank, and I'm a runner in Ithaca, New York. And I'm here to tell you about the Picantico Hills Marathon that happened last Saturday um, in Terrytown, New York, which is right in the Hudson Valley. Uh, so it was the first year of the marathon and I was really excited to see the race posted because uh, that was uh, my old training grounds in college. We went out there for every single long run. So there's a lot of nostalgia while I was running the race. 
Um, we started right near the Hudson River and wound through forests and hills, um, a lot of rolling hills on carriage trails um, on the course, uh, and then wound up a very um, long, steady climb around miles, I want to say 9 to 13, um, going up to an overlook, which I'd actually only run up to once uh, in my college training. So because it's a, a pretty continuous, steady climb. Um, around that time, between the start of the race and like the halfway point, the temperature climbed about 15 degrees. Uh, so a lot of people started out in a combination of shorts and pants and tank tops and long sleeve shirts. I started out in a tank top and tights, um, and I actually got overheated around the halfway point and I actually found someone at an aid station who had a Swiss army knife who cut off my tights. So that was kind of a exciting moment and a good choice because um, I felt much better the rest of the race. So around uh, the halfway point, maybe miles like 15, 16, um, the course has a really nice continuous downhill and rolling hills um, all that wind eventually back down to the Hudson River where the finish line is. Um, and so it was one of those races where you could um, potentially negative split in the second half because you do a nice climb up and then a big uh, descent down. Um, and other than that, I mean, the scenery is beautiful. It's one of my favorite places to run, so I highly recommend it and um, the organization was excellent aid stations throughout the course every two to three miles um, and great people. All right, thanks Ian for inviting me to give a, a race report. Good job, Margaret, and thanks for that clip. And then the Bold Coast Bash, 10 mile, 20 mile, well, actually 10 and a half mile, 21 mile and 50K in Cutler, Maine went down. Uh, this is one that I'd been looking forward to since uh, being aware of it for their inaugural year in 2019, which I wasn't able to make. Um, I ranked it uh, one of the most scenic uh, races in Maine, and that's also on the Trails Collective uh, article on most scenic races in the Northeast. And, um, and that was just after seeing some pictures and reading of the course. It really sounded spectacular, um, and it really didn't, didn't disappoint. Uh, it was COVIDed last year, uh, so it didn't happen, and so it was rolled over to this year. Uh, almost didn't make it happen, but uh, made it happen with the context of uh, following up in regionals, two flights to get me to Bangor, two and a half hour drive to Bangor. I think I arrived um, where I was staying around midnight and had to get back up around 4 or 4.30 to get over to the, uh, the start, uh, but it was totally worth it. Uh, and how the day shook, shook out, uh, winds went to Ben Nephew and Courtney Marchetti in the 50K, Eric Brooks and Molly Siegel in the 21 miler, and uh, Ren Salisbury and Caitlin May in the 10 miler. And I really had a wonderful day out there. I had the opportunity to share the first, so it's a three loop course for the 50K. And I had the opportunity to share the first two loops with my teammate and friend, Ben Nephew. I uh, hadn't caught up in a while and really, really just enjoyed that time to just connect. Um, just caught up uh, the first uh, number of hours we were out there. And I think just also uh, genuinely um, exclaiming to one another just the beauty as we were going of the course. Um, I flagged a little bit. I, I tend to not really care about eating or drinking and that often comes to bite me in the, uh, in the tail uh, mid-race. So by like uh, 19 or 20 I was flagging a bit, needed some calories, just a, a low blood sugar level and uh, forced him to kind of cut the cord and uh, go on for the, uh, the win and it allowed me on my third loop to really just enjoy being out there. Um, so it was really for me about the place versus the race. And I think this is a course to uh, make that the MO. Uh, it really is that spectacular. The uh, wooded sections are technical. Uh, you've got a lot of rocks, uh, some very quite slick. Uh, you've got some really slick moss covered uh, bog kind of uh, foot planks and bridges, some with uh, spikes and nails sticking out of them. You've got rooted sections. Um, but it just adds to the boldness. And, but you also have these just beautiful, beautiful green mossy forests that seems like Gandalf is gonna kind of walk out of the woods uh, at any point. 
and then you get the coastal sections, which is just dramatic. You get these cliffs, and you get the waves crashing into the rocks, and you're going up and down over the coastline, um, and it's just so alive, and there's just so much energy. Uh, we lucked out with a, um, it was about 50 degrees, it was pretty blustery to start, uh, which made some of the waves crashing into the rocks all the more dramatic, uh, but I really couldn't have asked for a better day out there. Uh, the day after was um, upper 40s, a steady rain uh, all morning, uh, cloudy, uh, really gusty, windy. Would have been a completely different, uh, I think, game out there. Um, but I can't say enough about the, the course, a really low-key event. They've got a small entrant cap on it, uh, so you have to get on it early. And it's not necessarily that accessible to a lot of, uh, a lot of people. I mean, it's way up there. It's right on the New Brunswick border. Uh, furthest eastern point uh, in the U.S., uh, but I can't say enough about it being worth the, the trip. Uh, so thank you to all those who put it on. Uh, ben, again, I was uh, thankful to share uh, some time with you, um, and so I'm just grateful for the weekend. All right, so leave you off with some upcoming events. November 20th and 21st, Cortland, uh, the CT Trail Mixers, rather, the uh, Connecticut Trail Mixers Fall Fling 400 Trail Race, uh, 400 minutes long, running in Southington, Connecticut. Terry Weil Half Marathon in Danbury. Tuckahoe 25K in Queen Anne, Maryland. Uh, shout out to the Tuckahoe crew. And, um, well, Trent Swanson and the crew, they're looking for a truck. So anybody out there who has uh, maybe a good truck, they want to sell the crew at the Algonquin 50K uh, race company, reach out to Trent Swanson. They could use one. Uh, Little Gunpowder 50K in Kingsville, Maryland. Camp Golf Fall Series number three in Mawa. And the Valley Trail Series Winter Race number one with a 5K, 5-mile, 10-mile in Alpine, New Jersey. The Green Chimneys Conquer the Forest Trail Run in Carmel, New York. Hex Hollow Half 6.66 and 13.13-miler in Glen Rock, PA. Fall Backyard Burn Trail Run in Fountainhead, Fairfax Station, Virginia. And the Crooked Road 24-Hour Ultra in Rocky Mount, Virginia. They are all on deck for the weekend. All right, so that's what I got for you this week. Uh, thank you so much in advance for tuning in. Thanks to all those who may be supporting uh, in Patreon support. Um, if you have an event coming up, for sure, let us know. If you've done something really cool, let us know. If you want to hear something in a certain episode, uh, let me know. And um, I really appreciate uh, all the clips and tips. All right, so we are collectively connected by Trails. Thank you for sharing these posts. Thank you for liking this station. And um, I will check you next week. Uh, all right, and until then, have a happy Thanksgiving ahead, and I will talk to you then. See you!